My guest this week is an author, a filmmaker, a former policy advisor to Ronald Reagan, and a guy who really, really doesn't like Hillary Clinton. Dinesh D'Souza, welcome to The Rubin Report. Good to be on. How was that for an intro for you? Would you would you want the doesn't really like Hillary first? Should I have done that first? Well, I think uh, had we done this a year ago, you'd have to have Obama, but we now can cross out Obama, put in Hillary. It's You're pretty much on target right there. I'm on target. All right, well, I'm looking forward to talking to you because I think we're going to agree on some stuff, disagree on some stuff, and that's what it's all about. And a couple weeks ago, you debated my former boss at uh, the Young Turks, Cenk Uger, and we're going to talk about that more in a little bonus segment we'll do after, but I thought at the beginning of your debate with him, you laid out a really nice case about your life and what it was like to come to America as a young immigrant and, and what America's all about. So I thought maybe you could just sort of recap that, just to start about your story. I think I said that, uh, you know, I think my story is, is similar to that of millions of immigrants who have come to America. Uh, historically, the Irish, the Italians, the Jews, today, the Koreans, the West Indians. So most of us grew up in societies that were messed up. Uh, India had a legacy of socialism for 40 years. Um, there's very little opportunity for a young man trying to make it in the world. Um, and also a lot of corruption, a lot of bribery um, built into everyday life. You can't get a ration card or you can't get a promotion. You got to slip a slip some bucks behind them into someone's pocket. So it leaves you kind of feeling dirty at the end of the day. So I thought, look, I want to come to a country where there's a lot of, uh, in, a, in a sense, a, a ladder of opportunity. And, um, and um, where a, a guy who has enterprise and is smart, willing to work hard, can move up that ladder and go as far as his talents will allow. And to me, America represents that, and that's the American dream. Uh, and, and my politics to this very day is based on that. So my politics is not based upon tax cuts or building a wall. It's based upon, at the end of the day, which side, which party protects that ladder of opportunity. Yeah, so before we get into the party part of it, uh, do you think that that concept itself has changed over the years? So you came here, what year was that? I came, well, I came as an exchange student in 78. I went to Dartmouth for four years, um, ended up in the Reagan White House in the 80s, yep. was in think tanks for about 20 years, uh, AEI in Washington, the Hoover Institution in Stanford, mm -hmm. um, and now I do books and movies. Yeah, so when you came here in 78, would you say that that time, or even through the 80s, or even through the 90s, would you say that that period of time allowed for a better opportunity than it would now? That seems to be the sort of meme out there, that the opportunity now is not as great. And I, I always wonder if that's actually true. Uh, I don't think it is. I, I think that it is true to a degree in the sense that there is more opportunity in certain fields and less in others. So uh, what happens is, you know, uh, I think the, it was the economist Schumpeter who said, capitalism is this gale of creative destruction. It comes out and knocks out industries and replaces them with new ones. So 100 years ago, most Americans worked on farms. And then uh, 30 years later, that we only needed a small number of people with tractors to be able to farm for the whole country and all the the other guys had to get off the farm. So if right. you were a farmer, not good, because opportunity was down. Right. But obviously new opportunities were opening up in manufacturing, et cetera. So today there are new opportunities in creative entrepreneurial fields, not just technology, but even services. Um, but there's less opportunity in traditional fields. And so people who go in those fields or who were trained all their lives feel stuck. Yeah, and people still want to come here, right? That, that's what I always say. When I hear from my friends on the left, and I was telling you before we started, I'm sort of a recovering progressive. I would say I'm a classic liberal, sort of libertarian. I'm sort of in that view right now. But I always find that my friends on the left are constantly basically crapping on everything America's about. And for all our flaws, and we can discuss many of them, Everyone still wants to come here, right? I mean, pe we're not disappearing from America, right? People still want to do better here. Well, I, you know, I call this the multicultural fallacy, which is that all cultures are equal and that no culture is better or worse than any other. Well, frankly, if that was the case, no one would ever immigrate <laughs> to some other place because it's right. really hard to leave your family and all the stuff you know and your life and your school and your friends. You have to uproot yourself and go into a completely new culture where you're a total stranger. That's not easy to do, and you wouldn't. Do it if you didn't think that this new society was in a in a market way better. Right, nobody's than the one moving you... to go. I'm going to leave everybody I know and every my culture and everything just so I can go to somewhere worse. Right, generally or, not how it is. Exactly. Yeah. So you're right. We're still the magnet uh, for the world, and that tells you something. Yeah, uh, I'm curious because uh, so you're from India. 
your skin tone is brownish to me. Is that fair to say? Totally. Okay, I didn't. Yeah, there was nothing uh, <laughs> racist or bigoted about that. Every time, you, every time you say something <laughs> obvious to people, they you're suddenly you're bigoted and racist and it's gross and whatever. Um, but the Indian community, which has done incredibly well in the United States, doesn't get sort of the social justice cred, despite the color of your skin, which is an interesting little dichotomy. Well, the what, Indians what are sort of, of seen as, uh, you know, as honorary whites. And this is, uh, this is what happens to successful communities. It's, it, you know, the left, in order to protect its narrative of oppression, has to sort of redefine successful people as belonging to the master class. Because otherwise, it would totally disrupt this idea that you have to be white and preferably male in America to succeed. Yeah. So what happens is these immigrants come to, and most of them today are non-white, right? Most immigrants don't come from Europe. They come from the West Indies, they come from Pakistan, and most of these immigrants do quite well. Mm -hmm. So it's actually the shame of America that the minorities who have been here the longest Blacks, Native Americans, uh, are actually being left behind with these other groups that kind of, they come to the inner city and they kind of leapfrog their way out. It, sometimes it takes two generations, but very often their kids at least get out of there. Yeah, and I know that all of, uh, you, would, you would lay blame for a lot of what's happened to the black community on the Democrats, and that's a lot about what this book and your movie is about, so we'll get to that in a little bit. But first you mentioned that you were, you were a policy advisor for Ronald Reagan. And I always think it's interesting because Ronald Reagan now is thought of as, you know, he, the gold standard for uh, conservatism and, and the right and all that stuff. And I think the right has, has really, I don't even know that the right knows what it is anymore because its nominee is, more, I think, really more of a centrist, almost Democrat who's sort of lying his way to trick people into thinking that he's going to believe in Republican principles, but, and we can unpack that if you want. Um, but tell me, what was it like working working with Reagan and, and in that way? Was it as magical as everyone would make it seem? Well, you know, uh, the thing about Reagan was on the face of it, he was ridiculous. I mean, here was a guy who <laughs> sort of uh, put in a short day at the office, was always joking around. It was difficult to take him seriously. Um, and most of the conservatives at that time didn't. I mean, they, they looked down on Reagan. And they also tended to feel that Reagan was sort of this bumbling guy and that you needed all the, you needed to be fortified with all these conservative think tank people. Otherwise, he would go off the reservation. Um, and, um, but to me as a student at Dartmouth, listening to Reagan, I realized that this implausible man was actually challenging some really big ideas. Mm -hmm. I and mean, he was actually offering the, uh, the notion that Soviet communism would collapse of its own weight. Uh, he was offering this idea that the whole uh, mutually assured destruction system of nuclear policy was obsolete after 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, he was challenging collectivism, which was the big idea of the 20th century. And so I I thought, wow, this guy is actually about ideas, even though he's not an intellectual. And he also, just measured by his own standard, accomplished a lot. He said X, Y, and Z. Eight years later, X, Y, and Z were happening. So I think he'll be judged as someone who was quite successful in achieving his goals, yeah. whether or not you agree with the goals. Sure. Uh, would you agree with my general assessment that I laid out of the Republican Party at the moment? It just seems to me that it doesn't know what it is at this point. As we're taping this, you know, we're a couple of days or a week away from the, the convention. We'll see what happens. I have a feeling he's going with Newt as VP, and that's a little more of a standard, you know, someone on the right and an establishment guy. But that's that they've chosen for whatever reason, and I, and I understand some of the reasons related to free speech and just frustration with the establishment, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. They've chosen someone who really, in no way, is is conservative, really. Yeah, you know, the, um, the so Reagan conservatism was based upon three very simple ideas. The world is a dangerous place, and we need to be a little bit tough. You can't talk, you know, can't, can't solve every problem with a UN cocktail conversation. <laughs> right, so you'd say uh, Trump would agree with that. So. Trump would agree with that. Yeah. Uh, number two, that a free market economy is the way to deliver mass prosperity. Not to say that there's no role for government, but the market itself, technological capitalism, is the best friend of the poor and mm -hmm. the ordinary guy. Uh, I think Trump would also agree with that in principle. Mm -hmm. 
And the third one is essentially that uh, we want to have a patriotic and decent society. You know, sometimes when we talk in libertarian terms of the free society, we act as if the content of that freedom doesn't matter, as if the founders would, would, had no preference as to whether you became a farmer or, say, a pornographer. <laughs> as long as you were free to choose, it was okay with them. No, they actually had some idea of what that American dream would look like. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Trump would agree with that, too. Now, this all being said, um, we're in a very different time than Reagan. Uh, even most of the ideas of Reagan preceded Reagan. Many people are waiting for Reagan. Where's Reagan? We want Reaganism. Right. But Reaganism was developed before Reagan. Uh, Jack Kemp, um, Gene Kirkpatrick, many others were talking about the ideas that later came to be known as Reaganism. Uh, Trump is also running kind of explicitly as a nationalist in addition to being a patriot. Uh, and that is a little bit of a problematic chord on the right, nationalism. Yeah. And I think that's what's caused some of the neoconservatives and those kind of guys to balk at Trump. Um, and then, of course, t Trump is just such a, an unknown, a wild card. And so even for me, I'm uncomfortable because I'm thinking I'm choosing between a known figure, Hillary, yeah. and an unknown figure, Trump. Um, and that's, it's difficult to compare. Yeah, and I know that you don't like the knowns about Hillary, and that's what this is all about. So we'll get to that in a little bit. But wait, we got, we got to go a little further on Trump, because I'm with you. So you, you, do you consider yourself a neoconservative? I, I saw that at some, it was you know, written I've on been, your Wikipedia. I take that for gospel, you know? I mean, I've been called, uh, you know, look, the, the, the right has been traditionally divided into the paleoconservatives, who are kind of the traditional old line conservatives. Then there are the neocons, who are basically the liberals who moved right. Yeah. Um, predominantly, but not not exclusively Jewish. And the third is, I would say, the evangelical slash Christian conservatives. I actually, well, I don't have three feet, but I kind of have one foot in each camp. Yeah. Uh, the think tanks I was part of were neocon, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I was also, in my youth, kind of an admirer of Bill Buckley and that kind of paleocon conservatism. I'm friendly to the, to the evangelicals and have debated atheists and sort of yeah, I was yeah. president of You've an You've debated some people that I've got their books right here, which we'll get to. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. And, uh, uh, but I'm not, you know, I'm not a hardline fundamentalist. I, uh, I keep very good... Uh, uh, friendships and relationships with the atheists, like Michael Shermer. Sure. Uh, in fact, we're heading off to a libertarian yeah. conference to do a debate on the Bible. Oh, very nice. Uh, oh, you very and Michael. Soon. Yes, oh, we're, very we're nice. debating very in nice. a couple of days. Yeah. Uh, and that's what libertarianism, of course, should be about, that the two of you should be able to sit down and say, well, I'm I'm a believer, I'm not a believer, but what's the role of government and all that stuff? And that's yes. that's really what the, the heart of libertarianism is. Totally. I mean I and I've always I've always uh, admired guys like Christopher Hitchens, Shermer, uh, guys on the left. I mean I did civil rights debates with people like Jesse Jackson, many of the civil rights scholars. Um, and they fall into two camps. One camp are the guys who enjoy a debate and recognize that it has an inherent value in a free society. And but there is another group that if you don't agree, they treat you're like the enemy. So yeah. like, like Chang, you know, yeah. I kind of felt like, <laughs> you know, this was a guy who sort of was very upset and then regarded, so he's debating the enemy as opposed to debating a fellow kind of seeker of truth. Yeah. And we're just trying to test our ideas against each other to figure out who's right. Yeah, well, I almost felt, uh, and again, I want to do a little bonus about it, so I don't want to go too deep into it, but, but real quick, I felt like you gave this really nice uh, intro on why you love America. And then he basically said, yeah, basically, I don't want to exactly quote him because I know this is what people do. But he basically was like, yeah, yeah, but now uh, Republicans want slavery. And it was like, Neh. like you're just trying to win points, not make a point, which I think are two very different things. Right. No, I, I think that that's right. I mean, I felt uh, I, there are different types of debates. Uh, that was a debate where he sort of came guns blazing. Yeah. And, and, and he just kept firing from the first moment. And, uh, you know... And, and I, I was trying to adopt the sort of Ali rope a dope strategy because I was just kind of leaning back and letting him punch it, not really trying to hit back because it's silly for me to, to you know, to to, to attack his past and so on. Uh, I really just wanted to s let him go, um, and and ultimately kind of try to get to the key question of which historically has been the party of bigotry and racism, and which is the party of racism now. Yeah. Um, all right, so I want to do a little more on neocons, then, then, then we're going to get right to that. So it seems to me that the, the phrase neocon, and I think this is really what you're saying in a way, doesn't really have that much meaning anymore. So it was sort of classic liberals that, found, that felt that, as you said, the, that there was an inherent value to our culture, and that at some point they felt we could export this, right? And then 
that was sort of then adopted by the right, I guess, sort of like by like a Cheney Bush situation. And we tried to nation build and it failed miserably. Would you, would you agree that, the, that, that they were basic failures? Yeah, see, I think when the, put into practice. Yes, I think that the, the Reagan approach was that you have a principle or an ideal but prudence is the way that you get from here to there. So for example, our ideal was to bring the Soviet Union down. But when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan with 100,000 troops, Reagan did not send 100,000 troops to push him out. Mm -hmm. Reagan basically told the Afghans, you fight, we'll help. So you go on the front line, you defend freedom, it's after all your freedom, but we'll give you some Stinger rockets to shoot down Soviet helicopters. This is called using prudence as a means to get to your end. Now contrast this with George W. Bush. Um, you know, this whole nonsense about the fact that in order to change a country, you have to invade the place. Right. Colin Powell's idiotic dictum that if you've invaded a country, you somehow own it. <laughs> uh, and you now have a responsibility to rebuild the whole place. Right. Nonsense. You, you know, politics is driven by the lesser evil. If you get a bad guy in, uh, out in power, your only responsibility is to put a less bad guy in his place, ideally a less bad guy who's friendly to you. Yeah. So you can actually do some business and trade with him. Uh, so I think American foreign policy needs to return to its modest goals of trade with us and don't bomb us. And that's pretty much it. Is that the irony about Iraq that kind of gets lost in everything is that Saddam was a bad person. We know this. We know he gassed the Kurds and had torture chambers and did all these horrific things. Although as Trump said a few days ago that he, uh, what was it last week? You know, he's, uh, he knew how to deal with terrorists, but did a lot of bad, he funded a lot of terrorism too and, and all kinds of other stuff. But the irony of Iraq is that we ended up getting rid of a guy that had nothing to do with 9-11, then we finally get the country to a place where they were having democratic elections, and then Obama withdrew troops, although Bush was the one that, that signed that order, and then the country went to shit. And it's like, we shouldn't, I would argue we shouldn't be there forever, but at the same time, it was incumbent upon us not to just pick up and leave one day, where now it's almost as, it's almost as bad right this very moment as it's bad at, been at any time in the last 10 years. It just makes America seem like a terrible ally uh, to rely on. Yeah. And this is, I think, why Karzai turned against us in Afghanistan. Um, yes, I, I agree. We were, we were trying to do something kind of brave in Iraq, which is to build a Muslim democracy. Now, that's kind of a good thing to pull off if you can, because there's so little example of that in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. There are Muslim democracies elsewhere, Indonesia. Um, there's democracy in India, which has a lot of Muslims. Mm -hmm. But there's really no democracy in the Middle East uh, that's a Muslim democracy. We were trying to make one. Yeah. And it was worth a try. Um, and I could possibly have worked, but, it, but we made it impossible for it to work because we lost faith in it and, and we basically decided to pack up and go home. Yeah, so it's, it's really part of, it's a bigger issue about our elections and everything because it's like, it was getting better, but Obama had committed to leaving as part of running the first time, so... He was going to leave no matter what. So I, I would put equal blame on both of them in a way. I know that Obama didn't start it, but by leaving the way we did, here we are. Yeah, and I think that in all these things, there were, you know, let's just look back at Bush. If Bush had said, look, uh, frankly, we don't really know who did 9-11 exactly. We also know that it isn't just Afghanistan because clearly these characters came out of Egypt and, pa and of Pakistan and the, some of them came from Saudi Arabia. Don't forget Saudi Arabia, what, 17 yeah. to 21? And, right, and there's, there's from all over the place, right? He's bowing to the So king, right? we're going to adopt kind of Wild West um, justice here, which, which is the, the sheriff who goes in the bar, the bad guys are in there, but he doesn't really know who they are. So he catches a couple of bad characters, bangs their heads together and walks out of the bar. Mm -hmm. And the message to everyone in the bar is, don't mess with us because right. we are rough guys and we shoot first. Now, if, if Bush had said that to the American people, most people would go, go for it. We don't care if Saddam Hussein did 9-11. Just go over there and t uh, grab some bad guys and bang their head in the ground. Yeah. But Bush didn't do that. He came up with this big elaborate, you know, weapons of mass destruction. So this is sort of like the cops who say, you know, there's, there's drugs in, the, in your house. I'm going to break down your door. Well, if you're going to break down my door, you better find some drugs. Yeah. <laughs> you don't find drugs, it's going to look pretty bad. Yeah. And that's what happened with us in Iraq. The moment that we couldn't find those WMDs, the whole operation, I think, lost credibility. Yeah. So all that said, would you, right now the Middle East, it's hard to tell if it's in the worst meltdown it's ever been, or now it sounds like Egypt's a little more stable and they're one of our allies and Jordan seems a little more stable, but, but Syria certainly. I mean, the whole place, what would you, as someone that 
sort of has the the philosophical underpinnings of a neocon, but I hear what you're saying. You're not for invading places to to give them democracy. What can you then do that would be more in the Reagan line of thinking to fix some of this stuff, like Syria, for example? Well, I think that you you want to, the simple pr principle is help your friends and, and curtail your adversaries. Yeah. And um, the reason to me the Iran deal is problematic is at the end of the day, is Iran going to be weaker or stronger? Probably yeah. stronger. So not a good idea. Yeah. Uh, Syria is complicated because you've got, it's kind of a replica of the old Iraq. You've kind of got a vicious dictator in there, but he is a secular dictator. And you've got some bad guys in the opposition. Um, typically, the problem has been that if the bad, if the opposition wins, which of that group is going to take over? Is it going to be the little Al Qaeda ISIS group? Uh, what happened in Afghanistan? We kicked the Soviets out. Very good result. But then the Taliban, the most ruthless and fanatical of the opponents, they come in and take power. So we were we we helped the Afghans kick the Soviets out, but we did no management after that. Right. Uh, we just let a group come in that was as hostile to us as the Soviets would have been. So basically, we take a failing store. We like put some paint on it for a little bit, but then we kind of just cut and run when uh, when trouble starts. That that seems to be a bit of a theme here. It's a theme. Now the world's a dangerous place. We can't fix it all. I don't yeah. think we should try to. Um, uh, so but where where do you draw that line? Because I think that's an interesting place. That look, my, I have a lot of friends on the left that'll say, you know, we should do absolutely nothing in Syria. I, I would argue that we shouldn't be nation building. But if there were co you know humanitarian corridors or something like that, then that would be fine. But I think my friends on the left often think they're taking the moral position by saying we shouldn't do anything. Meanwhile, how many, what, 300,000 people are dead in the last five years or something to that effect? Yeah. So that, that never strikes me as the moral position. It strikes me as sort of you know, the ostrich with the head in the sand position. Yeah, this notion that sort of um, moral positions are held um, uh, abstracted from the conditions in the world, I think is foolish. I mean, we were right to ally with Stalin against Hitler. Now, Stalin was a really bad guy, but Hitler was worse and posed a bigger threat at the time. Uh, today, a lot of people are like, I'll never vote for Trump, I'm never Trump, and all this stuff. And they say, I'm standing on principle. But my reasoning is, look, American politics is played in teams. Here are the two teams. Yeah. If you don't want Hillary and the Democrats, well, frankly, you got Trump and the Republicans. There's no alternative to those choices. Historically, the abolitionists, we admire them. They were against slavery, You're right. but the abolitionists were cranks. You know, most of them, their political activity involved things like, let's get together and burn the Constitution. You know, that was what they did. <laughs> right. It's only when the abolitionists were integrated in the Republican Party, and the Republican Party won the 1860 election, the Republican Party fought the Civil War, yeah. that's how slavery ended. The abolitionists couldn't have ended it on their own. That's interesting because it sounds to me like like you're selling a much broader piece of the Republican Party than people think of it as, right? I mean, you've, you've just said you don't mind debating an atheist and you can both accept that you have certain, I, I don't know that Michael, I don't think Michael's a Republican, but, no. uh, but, but he's but, definitely but, not a Republican. But an atheist, oh, he's a libertarian, really, An atheist but, can be a conservative. Uh, sure. I wouldn't deny that for a minute. Yeah, so, is, so it's sort of branding for you guys. And I think the Democrats have their own branding problem. But would you say it's a branding issue for the Republicans in general? Well, I would say that the, the Republican Party has treated its own brand very badly. One of the things that Reagan did do is he built that Republican brand. And and it was a very good brand. In fact, it was such a good brand that the liberals who had built the liberal brand, by the time Reagan finished, they wouldn't call themselves liberals. Even <laughs> Hillary was asked, are you a liberal? She goes, no, no, I'm not a liberal. Uh, I, and, and the liberals have kind of gone back to the progressive label from mm -hmm. the early part of the century. So Reagan actually I did. prefer regressive. Will you, will you join me on that? <laughs> uh, right, uh, the, well. The audience knows that's, uh, that's my preference. Personally. Yes. Um, well. Uh, point the point being that that I think the Republicans with with Iraq, uh, with all the kind of uh, the Bush uh, heavy spending and deficits, uh, the, he burned the Republican brand pretty badly. Yeah, so that was not good.